Greetings and welcome to the True Disciples broadcast. For the next 30 minutes, my goal is to inspire you, to educate you, to hopefully challenge you, and for some who may be listening, my hope is that we'll activate you into a greater confidence of taking your Christian faith and uh, taking it into the everyday world and engaging your culture. My name is Dr. Kevin Baird. I am the lead pastor of Legacy Church here in Charleston, South Carolina. We are a non-denominational church, and uh, our vision is wide and varied. Uh, We certainly reach those that are hurting. We disciple those who are uh, needing help and putting their lives back together, but we're also a culturally engaged church because we believe that a part of the Great Commission is uh, to help a people and uh, nations even be successful. And so we feel like we have something to share and our values need to be represented on the table of public opinion. I've been a pastor for nearly 30 years now. I've been a college professor, an academic dean. Uh, I've had uh, the blessing of being a conference speaker. I'm also uh, a husband and a father. Been married to my wonderful wife for 31 years and an overall nice guy. So I'm so glad you tuned in this morning, and uh, we're just glad to be able to share a little bit uh, of your day. I'm also the executive director of the South Carolina Pastors Alliance, which is a growing network of over 200 pastors that are linked together in the state that I live in, the state of South Carolina. And uh, we're helping clergy, ministers, and Christian leaders use their influence for faith, family, and freedom. We feel like pastors historically have had a place uh, in the public discussion and the great public debates, and so we're doing our best to activate pastors all over our state. We're also networking with other alliances all over the nation in order that we can uh, bring our values, Christian values, Uh, to the uh, public square. One of the reasons why we're on the radio this morning, we just want to be able to enter the discussion and uh, let you hear what a Christian worldview sounds like and uh, letting us be a part of of the great discussions that we're having in this day and age. Um, I want to give you some ways as we get started today uh, to communicate with us. You can check us out. Hopefully you'll take the time to do that. Everybody has uh, the ability to access the web and email and all the social media. But if you'd like to get in touch with us, you can go to either one of two websites. You can go to LegacyChurchSC.org. That's LegacyChurchSC.org. Or you can go to SCPastorsAlliance.net. Again, SCPastorsAlliance.net. Both the Church Legacy as well as the Pastors Alliance sponsor this True Disciples program and uh, we're glad for that. On Facebook, you can find me uh, under uh, Kevin Baird. You can go to Legacy Church and like our page there. You could go to the South Carolina Pastors Alliance page. That may be the best way uh, to keep in contact with us and see the upcoming updated happenings in either of these areas. We're on Twitter at Pastor Baird as well as at South Carolina Pastors. You can email me at that same Legacy Church SC at AOL.com. SC Pastors Alliance at AOL.com. And of course, we're on YouTube at Legacy Media and uh, just doing our best to uh, be engaged in every venue that is available out there. Hey, last week we had a wonderful interview. This week I'm looking at just sharing a little bit. A lot of things are going on in our culture. Some decisions have come forth from the Supreme Court. Uh, There's always the uh, discussions and oftentimes intense discussions with regards to some of the social issues of our day. And and I'm not going to jump straight into the social issues um, because most people who listen, whether uh, they understand a conservative Christian worldview or not, or or whether they're a total uh, secularist, uh, when we hear about social issues, we automatically uh, presume we know where folks are going to land. We presume we understand why they're going to land there, or we've created our own reasons as to why they're going to land there. And before we just start in commentary in the weeks and months ahead, I thought it would be good just to take a program in this short 30-minute segment that we have to just take some time and do some explaining uh, with regards to what the evangelical mindset is all about. You know, you, you hear the phrase, 
they're an evangelical Christian or they're an evangelical believer. And it's a label, and I, I hate labels. The reason I hate labels so much is because uh, when you use it, it can never quite summarize everything you may or may not believe. And so uh, it can leave gaps in people's understanding. But the other reason I, uh, I don't like uh, labels is because we're living in a great era of redefinition. In fact, we're redefining all sorts of words in order to have them mean something different than its original intent. Um, one of the areas, I think, is is the word Christian. I mean, I, I believe it's turned now into a cultural term. And a lot of times, if a person isn't Buddhist or they're not a Muslim uh, or they're not an atheist, um, a Hindu, uh, then by default, uh, they become Christian. And that's not really the definition. It's not a, a default word. It, it literally means someone who not only ascribes to the teachings of Jesus Christ, but uh, has had some form of, of life-altering or transforming experience uh, causing them uh, to walk in his ways, uh, as well as adhering to the authority that he brings through his word. I mean, that's how uh, the word Christian, uh, I guess, would be defined in its, in its most general sense. But there are all sorts of redefinitions that are going on. Uh, I know the word love has been greatly redefined in our era. Uh, love, true love, is no longer attached to any sense of truth or any sense, really, of, of commitment. Uh, love is being relegated to simply feelings and uh, some sort of, of emotion. And while love may have those aspects to it, uh, love has a definition to it that is currently being redefined. We've redefined the word truth. Um, you know, I'm hearing these days people will say to me often, uh, well, you know, Pastor Baird, uh, that's your truth, and this is my truth. And that very statement uh, violates the nature of truth, uh, because truth uh, is objective. Truth can only really be one thing. And, and so we're living in this great era of redefinition, and I simply share that because I believe that when the label comes out, evangelical Christian, that there is a surmising that takes place or there is uh, sort of a presumption that begins to enter into a lot of people's minds as to what that means. Now, I, I, I'm not going to say that today in the short amount of time I'm going to be able to solve uh, what uh, evangelical means to every person who may use the label, but I, I want to at least begin that discussion because you have a right as a listener to begin to understand you know, where we're coming from and to understand evangelicals because there's sort of this, this idea that somehow or another we're out here just trying to make it difficult for everyone else to live their life when that really isn't the case. Uh, the case is we believe that people were designed to live abundant lives and successful lives. We believe people were designed by God to really enjoy their life with as little dysfunction and interruption as uh, possible from difficult, even challenging circumstances. But until you understand how that is forged in us and then how that philosophy is played out of us, then it becomes sometimes a confusing and uh, a misunderstanding thing. And so we're going to talk about that uh, today for just a moment or two. You know, you realize, and it doesn't take much illustration to tell you, that we're facing enormous problems today in our culture, seemingly hopeless, complicated problems. In fact, um, there's breakdowns at every level from the individual family, individual lives, uh, through our, our neighborhoods, our communities, into our state, and ultimately in the nation and globally. And what's interesting to me is oftentimes is that we'll elect some of the brightest people we think uh, to governmental offices, and uh, we hope that through all of their campaigning and their promises that they will be able to bring solutions and answers and help to much of the breakdown that we see happening around us. And what happens is we have these incredibly smart people who are, are running for office. They have degrees from Harvard and Yale and, and notable universities, and, and yet they go to the halls of Congress, whether it be in our nation or state, and things just seem uh, to spiral even more 
out of control. And so, and, and so there's a great frustration that exists. And I'm just simply here to share the viewpoint that I believe conditions will continue to be hopeless if God is continually taken out of the equation. And they'll continually to be continue to be hopeless if God's people fail to recognize that the solution to many of our problems simply does not uh, reside in man. Uh, it does not reside even in our capacity uh, to think and reason that there are things beyond our capacity as human beings uh, to deal with, and we need the help and the intervention of God. And and if we use the word God, we, we believe that he's real. We believe that he overshadows and oversees all things. And if we say that we trust in him, it all boils down to a moment where we have to ask ourselves the question, do we really? Do we really believe that when we walk according to his ways, when we adhere to his word, when we do our best uh, to genuinely walk in both love and grace and truth and justice, and all these things that are perfectly reflected in God, and as we are endeavoring to walk in those things, do we really believe, as the Scripture says, that righteousness will exalt a nation? Do we really believe that his ways are the only solution to our present difficulties? Now, let's be honest at this point. I mean, Washington isn't going to save us. In fact, Washington, D.C., has done more to harm us and, and to cause us to be dysfunctional than probably any singular thing that is going on right now. It doesn't matter if you're listening to me and uh, you're a Democrat or you're a Republican or you would call yourself an independent. We aren't going to find all of our solutions in political philosophies. Uh, you can adhere to the fair tax. You, you might want more tax. But truth of the matter is more taxes or less taxes don't uh, necessarily at their root, help solve all the problems that we're facing. There has to be some transcendent understanding. There has to be something beyond ourselves that we rely on and look to, and that uh, person, I believe, is God. And, of course, being a Christian, I believe God was revealed in his son, Jesus Christ. But the key is, in order for that to happen, we have to begin to renew our thinking. We have to change our thinking. We have to begin to have our mind renewed. We have to recover uh, the mindset of a Christian population. And so I just want to read to you some verses. Uh, We haven't had a chance to do that uh, in in the previous program, but I wanted to make sure I took some time uh, in this program to just read some verses to you and, and, and let these soak into you. I'm going to read out of the book of Colossians. Colossians is one of my, really one of my favorite New Testament books, the reason being is that, uh, number one, Paul wrote it out of a jail cell. And I've often said that anytime you have a real good revival, (laughs) there's a preacher that goes to jail somewhere. Uh, So he's in a jail cell. And as he's writing in a jail cell, he's reminding his listeners of several things. And so I want you to listen carefully. Out of Colossians uh, chapter 2, I'm going to begin reading with verse 8, just a couple of verses here. Uh, But just let it soak into you for just a moment. This is what he writes. He says, Beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. For in him, meaning Jesus, dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and you are complete in him who is the head of all principality and power. I love those verses. I love the book. Now, folks, here's what he's saying. He's saying that we've been robbed. In other words, we've been, we've been duped, so to, say, so to speak. Uh, we've been deceived uh, by an intentional and insidious plan to render us powerless and impotent and really of no consequence in the earth. Uh, he says here that we've been, we've been cheated through philosophy and empty deceit. And uh, we know that to be true. We've, we've been promised all sorts of things, but, but through all the promises, we've never seen uh, it come to pass or to manifest. And to be candid with you, I believe, most importantly to those who may be believers at this particular moment, uh, it's worked in the Church of America. In fact, in many ways, the church has become impotent. Uh, it's become irrelevant. Uh, there was a day 
Uh, whether you be a pastor, a leader of a local church, or the church itself, there was a day when we were at least given a begrudging respect uh, with regards to the values we would bring to the public discussion. But in the day we're living in now, it's become fashionable to challenge it all. In fact, not just to challenge it, but to taunt it uh, with no repercussion, but rather people will applaud you for doing it. And to some extent, we brought that on ourselves. There has indeed been inconsistency within the life of pastors and churches, and there's been hypocrisies and And we would admit that right off the bat. However, I want to remind you there's over 350,000 churches in America. And while there might be a a small percentage of those that uh, would be fraught with inconsistency and hypocrisy, there's a great number of those that are on target, solid, credible, uh, work, solid pastors as well. And uh, just wanted you to keep that in mind because sometimes our eyes can get on on the frailties, and we forget that there's other good things that are going on. But but we've been relegated to a place of of, uh, marginalization. Uh, We're we're pushed off to the side. You really don't have anything more to say in this era that uh, we're living in. And and I guess to some extent we could say the church has been granted the permission to, you know, uh, marry, to bury, uh, and then uh, to maybe remind us on occasion of some moral virtue, although even that's being challenged in the days we're living in. And so the question is, how did we get to this point where where we are no longer being taken seriously? Well, uh, I'll just suggest that Paul had it right in the uh, first century. It still works this way in the 21st century that we've been robbed. We've been robbed through philosophy, through empty deceit, through the traditions of men according to the precepts of the world. Now, that's the way Paul said it, but what he means is this, and we're going to translate this down to to, to a very simple way of saying it. He's saying that we have been trained to think the wrong way. We've been trained to think the wrong way. We We have slowly exchanged what at one time was a a Christian or a biblical worldview, Uh, we have been trained now to think a different way into what we would call a secular one. Now, a worldview, for those of you that might not understand what worldview means, if if you can imagine, let me give you just a quick illustration. If you could imagine wearing a set of glasses, I I, I wear glasses, and I, I don't see things well unless I have my glasses on. And so everything that comes to me in the world, I have to see through the lenses of my glasses. If I don't have those lenses on, I, I can't drive, I, I, I can't navigate life, I can't do life. Well, your worldview is like a pair of glasses. Uh, your worldview is the lens by which you understand or you interpret all the things that go on in your world. So whatever your worldview is, if something happens, uh, let's say a war erupts, or let's say um, uh, uh, the economy goes bad, or let's say that you're facing a personal difficulty in your marriage or your, your children are challenging, your, your worldview is your lens by which you begin to interpret how you will see these events and ultimately how you will answer the important questions that perhaps these events Uh, cause to arise. And everybody has these glasses. Everybody has a pair of worldview glasses that they interpret the world with. And you're going to answer questions with these glasses. Uh, Some of the questions you're going to answer are questions like, how did I get here? Uh, Was I just an accident? Was this a coincidence? Did I get here by chance? How was I made? Uh, Is this just a, a biological capricious happening, or is there a creator involved in this? What's my worth? I mean, if I'm just simply the product of evolution and animals that are evolving into more complex structures, then perhaps I'm no different than the animals, and perhaps I can even act like the animals. But if I'm created in the image of God, then perhaps my my worth and my value would be infinitely more uh, important than the animals, and maybe my behavior should be better than the animals. Why am I here? I, I, am I just here at this time because that's just how it worked out? Do I have a purpose? How should I live? Where am I going? 
I mean, I could ask all kinds of questions right now to you, and you would answer those questions by virtue of what pair of glasses, worldview glasses, you have uh, on your eyes, so to speak, to interpret all of these events. Now, here's our problem. And again, um, we're going to be spending week after week on subjects just like this, but here's our problem. Our problem is, is that we've been trained to think or we've been trained to understand through our schools, the media, uh, the cable news, the newspaper, the movies, the universities, literature, music. I mean, you and I are inundated 24-7 with voices that are constantly uh, forging a view in us. Um, you know, I've... I've know for a fact that you can go to universities and and their view is going to be uh, politically left of center. Um, they're going to teach you an evolutionary theory, uh, which although it is uh, not uh, been proven uh, to be an exact science, they're going to at least uh, tell you or make you think it is. I, I mean, we're going to be taught certain things. We're being taught certain morals through through media and music and and Hollywood. We are taught these things until they become and are forged into our lens by which we evaluate all of our life. And although it may be simplistic at this moment to say, well, because celebrities do it, therefore why can't I do it? Well, it's because you've been forged and and you've been uh, uh, taught or trained to think in a certain way to where that now is your normal and that seems normal. And and what has happened through the years is is that we've slowly migrated away from our traditional Judeo-Christian ethic, we've migrated away from many of our understandings that this country was founded on uh, through the Scripture that has caused us now as a nation to begin to move away or migrate away from those principles, those first principles that have caused us to be successful. And you have to realize that ideas and thoughts have consequences. I mean, if if you're going to live an idea or a thought uh, that will have a certain consequence. And, and the reason our nation is so currently uh, messed up and the reason our culture is so dysfunctional is because we have bought lies on every imaginable uh, area and subject. We're, we're currently buying lies about ourselves. Uh, again, were we created in the image of God or, or did we serve, or did we just morph from uh, the animal kingdom? We're being taught things about marriage and the nature of marriage and the nature of covenant and the nature of love. If if these things are not found on truth, then what happens is it perpetuates dysfunction in, instead of bringing us stability. Uh, and what you think about all these things is what you will become as a person. And what our culture thinks about these things is what we will become as a culture. And what our nation thinks about these things is what we will eventually look like as a nation. And right now in America, there is a, a, a war. I hate to use this term, but I'm not the one that uh, originally brought it up. But there is indeed an idea war that is going on as to how we are going to think as a nation. And so we're clashing. We clash at every, at every corner. We're clashing over whether or not you can, you can pray at at, at public events and in city council meetings and in school and at graduations. We, 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 we war over whether or not you can wear a Christian uh, T-shirt or a religious uh, T-shirt uh, within a public school, um, singing Christmas carols, nativity scenes. Every, every Christmas time we hear how there's a war on Christmas and we'll, we'll fight over nativity scenes. And, and uh, it, it, it has reached into our neighborhoods, whether small groups can, can meet for Bible study in homes and whether that breaks zoning laws. And can a church even start in a home? And are we going to call it winter break or will we call it Christmas break? And these are the symptoms of something uh, insidious that are being reprogrammed by our culture. And so we have got to begin to recover the Christian mind. Now, I have laid out for you uh, in the short time that I have this morning, uh, just several things that uh, I'm wanting to put out there for you to begin to chew on. Now, 
The good news is there are answers to all of these things. I, I'm not going to have time in this program to go into all these answers, but that's why you're going to tune in next week to this same station, and uh, you're going to continue to listen because I want to begin to build in you an understanding of why we think like we think and how we're going to think again in this capacity. And uh, and I want to just leave in the last few minutes with this this last thought, and it's this. There's no such thing as neutral. I want you to remember that phrase. I, I, I for years, thought that there was somehow, some way we could be neutral in our culture, but there's really no such thing as neutral. Uh, some ideology, some way of thinking, uh, some perspective, some, some political viewpoint is always going to win. It's always going to prevail. And so, so the question always becomes which which viewpoint or which ideas will prevail because all of these ideas have consequences. And don't let anybody tell you that uh, the television isn't giving you uh, a viewpoint. Don't let anyone tell you that your government doesn't give you a viewpoint. Uh, school is not neutral anymore. There is not a neutral atom in this whole universe. In fact, everything will eventually embrace or encompass a perspective or a worldview or a way of seeing things. And, and so I want to encourage you, at least as we begin to, to conclude and, and wrap up our program for today, begin to identify uh, how it is you think. How, how would you answer the questions that I originally put to you? Uh, w- w- what's your basis for truth? What's your basis of understanding? Are you deriving it simply from your opinion, or do, do you have a place where you would look to and say, hey, that's my authority, that's, that's where I am landing? And, and to be able to admit that that's, that's where you derive your viewpoint. I'll be fully candid with you. My viewpoint comes from the Scripture. That is my authority. That's where my worldview has been forged and where it derives from. And I, I fully uh, admit and disclose that. But where does yours come from? Would you say it comes from there, or, or would you simply say it has come from your, your experience or a tradition? Where has it come from? Because it's going to be very important, because until you understand where it comes from, uh, you will never begin to understand whether or not it's worthy to be your foundation by which you can build your life and where a nation uh, can build its future. And so uh, we're going to continue to delve into that next week. I hope you tune in uh, to this station. And as uh, we're beginning just to wrap up here, I want to remind you of several things. I'd really love to hear from you. I hope you take the time to let us know you're listening. Uh, You can follow us on Twitter at Pastor Baird or at South Carolina Pastors. That's with an S, South Carolina Pastors. You can email me at LegacyChurchSC at AOL.com or at SC Pastors Alliance at AOL.com as well. Certainly you can go to the web, find our websites, uh, go to Facebook, and make sure that uh, you're following us on Facebook and we can keep in contact with you. And uh, we would love to know that you're out there listening to us. And as we're sort of wrapping this last uh, few seconds up, I want to read something to you that I ran across from Dr. Martin Luther King. You know, Dr. Martin Luther King, whether you would embrace uh, everything that he believed or not, Um, He certainly had an understanding of what it meant to stand uh, in the public arena and to stand uh, for truth. And, And one of the things that he said was this, and I'm just going to quote it. The church must be reminded that it is not the master nor the servant of the state, but rather the conscience of the state. If the church does not recapture its prophetic zeal, it will become an irrelevant social club without moral or spiritual authority. Well, that's exactly what we're doing here at True Disciples. So it is my hope that you tune in next time. And until then, keep walking the walk. And I want you to keep being a true disciple. God bless you.